Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this Open Access Week 2014 planning kickoff webcast, and also for those of you watching the, the future recording of this. Uh, this is our first live webcast, uh, I guess, in support of this year's Open Access Week activities. Uh, the idea here is really just to connect uh, you know, people that are planning uh, events for this coming year with you know, some fantastic uh, organizers of Open Access Week uh, events from years past. Uh, and we have three fantastic speakers whom I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to give a little bit of introduction, a little bit of background about this year's International Open Access Week. Uh, as many of you have likely seen by now, uh, the theme for this year will be Generation Open, which we are really, really excited about. Uh, and, you know, I think we, we want to explore this, this idea of Generation Open in a number of different ways and hope that, um, you know, you can sort of uh, come at this, this idea of Generation Open from different angles to make it best suit your, uh, your campus or your organization. So sort of most straightforwardly, uh, we hope that this theme will be uh, a way to emphasize the importance of student and early career researcher involvement uh, in open access advocacy and awareness raising efforts and really highlight the work that, that students and early career researchers are already doing uh, to promote open access and also as sort of uh, a way to encourage more involvement with that, that particular community. Um, so that's probably the most straightforward take at it, but we also have other ideas. Um, for example, uh, exploring what open access means uh, to scholars and researchers at different stages uh, of their careers and sort of uh, very closely uh, sort of in hand in hand with that, um, looking at the, uh, the research assessment process and its effect on the open access publishing enterprise, so having discussions around things like the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment and how, uh, you know, the research assessment process and sort of the culture of the academy, uh, you know, has an impact on particularly students and early career researchers' ability to publish in open access journals and, you know, how the incentive structures in place at universities and within research funding bodies, uh, you know, have, have an impact on, uh, you know, the, uh, the choice of, of people in publishing in open access outlets. Um, and then lastly, we're very excited to get your ideas uh, for, you know, directions that we can take this, this theme in. So uh, we're very keen to, to get feedback and other ideas for, uh, you know, how we can how we can sort of celebrate this idea of, of Generation Open. So if you have ideas, uh, feel free to tweet them with the hashtag, and I'll, I'll talk about sort of the interactive part of this webcast uh, at the end. Uh, as I mentioned before, most of this particular webcast will focus on uh, sort of learning from people who've organized successful events in past years. Uh, but I did want to go over uh, a few very, very brief quick tips for engaging students. So if you're energized leaving this webcast, you already have uh, you know, some tips for, for going out and engaging uh, the student and early career researcher community on your campus. Um, so just briefly, uh, at first, I think uh, it's important to reach out early uh, and really invite, uh, you know, students and early career researchers to, to participate in the planning process from Open Access Week in the beginning and, you know, having their input and putting the program programming together. Um, you know, and really being involved so that they feel some real ownership over uh, the events uh, when it comes to October. So, you know, just reaching out now um, before, you know, the end of the, the, uh, the, end of the summer. Um, also, I think one of the things that we've learned over time is that it can be particularly effective to target student organizations and student governments. Um, uh, certainly individual students are fantastic, and you may know already, um, you know, some great students to work with on your campus, but we found that, um, you know, targeting student governments can be very effective um, and generally have had, you know, very, very good success rate and, uh, you know, talking to student governments and seeing them get active. And I know that many uh, libraries in particular have successfully partnered with student governments in the past. Uh, and similarly, I think research-intensive student organizations, uh, like, for example, a medical student association on your campus or a chapter of, uh, you know, medical, the National Medical Student Association, uh, you know, are sort of a natural group of, of students that are, are particularly uh, inclined to be interested in this issue since they use uh, the research liter literature so often. So, uh, you know, targeting organizations of students can be a particularly effective tactic. Um, then uh, we also hope that people use Open Access Week as a way uh, to get students involved in sort of the long term. So, um, you know, using uh, participation in the event as a way to build a longer relationship. You know, for example, uh, if you're pushing for an institutional open access policy at your campus, if you don't have one, 
uh, you know, students can be a really powerful ally in advancing that and working with students and building that relationship during open access week events can be a great way to, to bring them into uh, the work that you're doing or starting to do if you're just at the beginning of the process to push for uh, an open access policy at your institution or, for example, to promote uh, an institutional open access fund if you have one. Um, and then lastly, um, a great way to, to reach out to these organizations is just to offer to attend meetings uh, to present. Uh, we've, you know, most of the time we found that, that student organizations and student governments are uh, you know, pretty open to having guest presenters come in and sort of gives you a captive audience that's right there that you can talk about uh, open access and start to build that relationship and hopefully get them involved. So I think that's a fantastic, fantastic first, first step. Um, Next, I just want to say that uh, we at Spark will be uh, offering as much support as we can uh, for all of you that will be celebrating Open Access Week uh, this year. This is the first of a series of webcasts that we'll do leading up to Open Access Week. Uh, some of the ones that we have in the works for the coming months will be uh, one specifically on uh, how to engage the next generation, so students in early career research, as well as uh, how students and early career researchers have been successfully engaged uh, in, in a number of projects. Um, so that will be targeted at people on campus that are looking to engage um, you know, students in particular uh, during the week. We'll also have a student-focused planning webcast for student organizations looking to celebrate the week. Uh, and then also sort of a planning in progress webcast where we'll have people uh, talk about their plans uh, for the year and check in and how it's going and give people some current ideas with how people are exploring this theme of Generation Open. Uh, and then lastly, we'd love to hear your ideas for webcasts and how uh, we might be able to support your work through other webcasts that we don't have here. Uh, we'd love to get those thoughts. So you can either put them in the chat box um, here in the webcast platform or you can tweet them with the hashtag Open Access Week and we'll, uh, we'll take a look. Uh, we're also working on an update to the Open Access Week website at openaccessweek.org and hope to provide more resources there, uh, sort of a more curated experience on the home page, um, highlighting some high-level messaging around Generation Open, and we'll make sure to, to send out updates uh, about that as it's available. Um, and then again, um, in general, just let us know what, uh, what you need, what can be useful uh, in helping uh, you, know, you and your campus and your organizations to celebrate this. Um, just let us know and, and we'll get to work on it. So with that, I just want to very, very briefly introduce uh, our presenters. I won't let them do most of, uh, of the talking, uh, but we're, we're very lucky to have three fantastic uh, organizers of successful Open Access Week events in the past. Uh, speaking first, we have Annalisa Taylor from the University of California, San Francisco, who's helped to or, uh, organize their uh, multiple Open Access Week uh, events in years past on everything from sort of putting the issue of open access in context at UCSF um, to having a, a, more, uh, a more targeted conversation at their system-wide institutional open access policy that was passed last summer. Uh, then we will uh, have a presentation from Daniel Mutonga, who's the past president of the Medical Students Association of Kenya, uh, just a remarkable uh, student advocate for open access uh, when he was uh, president of that organization. He led uh, their Open Access Week efforts in 2012, which I think touched almost every medical student um, or every medical university in Kenya and was just tremendously successful in raising awareness uh, of this issue, not only among medical students in Kenya, but also with administrators and faculty there. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with uh, Marianne Reed from the University of Kansas, uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with for a number of years on their Open Access Week uh, events and uh, have attended many of them uh, in person, and I can you know, speak from personal experience that they've been absolutely fantastic. Uh, the University of Kansas has done a particularly good job in recruiting pretty, uh, pretty good crowds for Open Access Week events, which can be a challenge uh, you know, in some places. So uh, I think they're particularly uh, you know, well-placed to give advice uh, on that front, but have had great events, uh, as I mentioned in the description for this event. They've even had their local representative, uh, Kevin Yoder, uh, come and speak on campus about the importance of the issue. Uh, so with that, I will just say that uh, we hope that uh, all of you that are on for the webcast will be active participants. Uh, the best way to engage uh, is to publicly tweet your questions or comments on Twitter using the hashtag OAWeek, uh, which we'll be monitoring and we'll uh, ask questions if we have time at the end from that. Uh, but if you're not on Twitter, you can also um, you can also post questions and comments in the chat box through the webcasting platform. Though if you are uh, have the ability to use Twitter, we do prefer that, so it's more public. Um, 
And without any further ado, uh, I will turn it over to Annalisa uh, to begin with her presentation from the University of California's perspective. Annalisa. Thank you, Nick. And uh, for starters, I'm, I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of the University of California at San Francisco, otherwise known as UCSF. We are a part of the University of California system. There's 10 campuses in the UC system. And UCSF is a unique in, that, in the sense that we're health sciences university exclusively. We were founded in 1868 as a private college, but became part of the UC system. Uh, or became affi affiliated with UC and then became an independent campus in 1970. So we, we don't have any undergraduate students. We have professional schools in dentistry, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy, and then we have graduate programs in the biomedical sciences. The reason that we have such a high ratio of faculty and staff to students and residents is that we do have a medical center. And we also are a very research-intensive institution with, you know, second highest recipient of NIH funding. So sometimes can be quite a challenging audience to um, get engaged over Open Access Week because they're just so so busy and there's so many demands on their time. So as Nick mentioned, we have been involved with Open Access Week ever since it was first Open Access Day, and the first one was in 2008. And we've always put out an, an open um, an information table during Open Access Week, and we do this one day during the week in a high traffic area, and we do it during the lunch hour. And we put out a table with flyers and a, a poster about Open Access that we can reuse from one year to the next. And we also get T-shirts, so we've been ordering the T-shirts from Spark, the open access T-shirts, and then we get cookies, and those are the ways we sort of draw people in. It's, it's kind of nice to have giveaways because people, a lot of people, especially students, are really interested in those things, and then you can kind of use that as your way to start talking to them about open access. Um, we've found that over the last few years that people, we've, People are more familiar and pretty pretty comfortable with open access, and especially in our in the health sciences. People are have embraced publishing in open access journals, and um, and so we've you know every year we revisit this. You know, does the information table is that still necessary? Or are there still people out there who just find this kind of more general overview of what's going on? What are the recent developments? Um, but I think especially for reaching our students, we still find this to be um, a useful service to provide, and often they're familiar with open access, they just don't know what it's called. And so as long as we have people who are still stopping by and showing interest, we'll continue to do that. We have put on other events as well during um, different open access weeks. Um, some of them have been, you know, more successful than others. Um, I'll highlight one that we put on last year in 2013, which was what we called our open access innovators. And this was an, a really interesting development that we found over the previous year where there were just um, these resources that were being developed by individuals at the university that are, you know, open access or open source um, resources that were sort of serving some sort of a need within the whole scholarly communication portfolio. And so we had a couple of uh, students, one of them actually had just graduated, the one on the left, and then the person in the middle um, is a current student at UCSF, and the person on the right is a staff member. And so the, uh, the, person, the student on the left had developed a tool called Journal Lab, which is for providing uh, evaluations and promoting discussion about published literature. And then um, the student in the middle has created a tool called Eureka, Eureka Science, which is online videos that basically translate scientific discoveries, important scientific or scientific publications for a general audience using a voiceover and a whiteboard with drawings and just does an excellent job with that. And then the person on the right has developed a tool called Wiki Pathways, which is a um, a wiki, open source wiki for um, signaling um, pathways information. And so this was a really great opportunity for us to be able to showcase some of the innovation and the talent within the university. And, and we also wanted to make a point of getting, this, you know, because we've had, the, you know, the two of the people were students, and so we thought that was really important to also particularly highlight those, those younger researchers. So, as I mentioned, you know, we've put on different events during different years, and 
I think what we found last year was that, you know, we were it, it, we're sort of at a different phase than we were several years ago when this first started and kind of evaluating, like, what things have worked for, for us, what what events does it make sense for us to put on during open access week, what our audiences do we want to target, and then what things do we want to sort of space out during the rest of the year. And I think that what, you know, what we felt like worked for us last year was, you know, there was there's the spark kickoff webinar that, you know, is at the beginning of the week. And then I, last year I noticed that there were just a lot more webinars in general. There was one put on by Elsevier and then um, ACRL. And so we found that actually those webinars, and we'll schedule those so that they're in a conference room and then open it up to all library staff. And I know some institutions will actually open it up to their community as well. Um, but that we found that, you know, it's, it's kind of a good opportunity during that week to dedicate some library staff time to getting, you know, up to speed on what's going on just for library staff. And for us, I think that events that have a broad appeal or that are very current or if it's things that the individuals, the scholars feel like it's something that has a direct impact on them or if it's some kind of a new innovative publication model or platform that's of interest to them, that's the kind of thing where we get an audience. And what we have found in our case, and I have talked with my colleagues, that especially at the other University of California campuses, and have kind of heard the same thing, is that events that don't quite generate the same kind of interest are things that are just policy focused, like if it's about if we, when we've had events that were just about our open access policy, those aren't as well attended or just more of a general, like what's going on in open access. I think that, you know, it's not, it doesn't mean that people aren't interested in it, it's just that that doesn't appeal to them enough to sort of make time in their very busy schedules to attend. So I mentioned that we have had some events outside of Open Access Week, and, you know, these things have come up often just because somebody has contacted us and expressed interest in coming for a visit, or just timing-wise, that's when people were available. And so I think, you know, one thing that's, I think, a good recommendation is to take advantage of people who are in your local area. And so in our case, Peter Binfield, who was formerly at PLOS and then left PLOS to start up the open access journal Peer J, um, lives in the San Francisco Bay Area, and so um, and we have a good relationship with him. And so he's come and, and, and spoken a couple of times at UCSF, and was in particular when he came and spoke about Peer J, which is just a very new business model for an open access publication. And then they're also doing some interesting things around open peer review. Um, and then a preprints as well for the biosciences, which is not that common in that field. Um, you know, we got a really good turnout for that, and then we we um, combined his presentation with you know our university librarian Karen Butter spoke, and then our faculty member Rich Snyder, who was really our champion for getting the open access policy passed at UCSF, and then it was passed um, a year later at the in the University of California system system wide. Um, so we sort of will get in those open the policy or the more general things, but, you know, coupling it with something that we know is going to really be of interest to um, a, a larger audience. Another event that we put on in January of 2013 was something that actually just sort of fell in our lap. We co-sponsored this event called Open Access Explored with Spark and with PLOS. And we hosted the event here at UCSF, but if you're, if you're not familiar with PhD Comics, it was, it's a really, really funny and really um, great cartoon strip that depicts the life of a PhD student, particularly scientists, by Jorge Cham, and he worked with Spark and with um, Jonathan Eisen, who's a faculty member at, at University of California, Davis, to develop a video of open access. Um, explained, and probably a lot of you have already seen that. But So that was a really big draw for us because of the popularity of PhD Comics and Jorge Cham. And Jonathan Eisen spoke, and then Heather Joseph also um, spoke and moderated the event, as Heather Joseph being the executive director for Spark. And so that is a great way, if there's any kind of a speaker out there who has a broader appeal, that can kind of you know highlight the importance of open access publishing. More recently, we actually, this was just earlier this month, we had a, an event about the revised data policy that PLOS implemented. And they've had a data, data policy for 
several years, but they've recently made it uh, reinforced it so that it's required to deposit your data sets on an open platform in order to publish in a PLOS journal. So we had the editor, one of the editors from PLOS, Theo Bloom, who was also the architect of this policy, data policy, come and speak, and then we invited one of our faculty members, Joe DeRisi, who's an open science advocate, and then Carly Strasser from the California Digital Library moderated it. And this is a topic that's very current and that is very much of interest. It's something that impacts scientists and scholars directly, and there's a lot of issues around it, a lot of questions about it. And so, you know, and we really want it, we held it with specifically for the purpose of generating dialogue and hearing different sides of the issue, not just a completely like this is what this is the way it has to be, but kind of just trying to get the the conversation and get the issues out there. So I think these were all things that, you know, we, we put them on either like as like this event, we really wanted to get it up and going while this issue was still really hot and the policy was this revision revision to the policy was pretty recent. And so, you know, that's important, I think, that, you know, to sort of focus what events need to happen during Open Access Week and maybe you know, to highlight during Open Access Week the other events that we've put on during the year that sort of, you know, because you get a lot of mileage out of sometimes one event. It's a lot of work to put on one event, but sometimes you can get a lot of mileage out of it um, throughout the year. So I also want to talk about some of the really great work that my colleagues at other University of California campuses have done. Um, we're, we are very much work very closely, all of the University of California libraries and campuses, and so um, we sit on a lot of committees together and we share with each other what our plans are for Open Access Week and then how things went afterward. And so um, I, I put up here a flyer that was for an event that the UCLA Library put on last year. And, you know, they have a number of events that they put on, but this was sort of their showcase event called Dissertation to Book, Separating Truth from Fiction. And they invited several industry, um, pub publishing industry people, as well as a vendor, ProQuest. And um, this was a very popular event. My colleague who um, spoke to me about this said it was, you know, it was in a room that held over 150 people, and it was pretty much full and very much appealed to graduate students. And I think this is a really great example of taking advantage of resources that are out there, you know, publishers that are either willing to travel or that have a local representative in the area. And I think these kind of events really appeal to people more when you've got sort of this mix and co-sponsorship. So in this particular case, this was sponsored by a couple of the academic departments at UCLA and um, and was really successful and I think just something that touches dear to in particular students who are in the social sciences and humanities close to their hearts which is if I put my dissertation online if they make their dissertation freely available online will they be able to publish it later on as a, as a book with a publisher and that's really a big concern of students and something that's definitely of interest and a couple of other examples, uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara, and UC San Diego also put on events last year that were targeted at graduate students, like just de demystifying open access, talking about the various um, flavors of open access publishing. And you know, the UCSB event had a couple of librarians and a faculty member who spoke, and then the UC San Diego had a panel of faculty from different departments at San Diego, and I think one person from UCLA as well. And, um, and you know, the outcome that they told me was that they felt that they would be, um, that they would serve these graduate students well by working through their liaison program. And so they're, they've developed, uh, implemented a liaison program working with the different departments at San Diego, and that they would be focusing on that group in particular this year with the um, Generation Open theme of Open Access Week. And then one more example at the University of California, Irvine, also had a panel presentation with their university librarian and faculty, and they touched on the open access policy at UC, which just passed, had just passed a few months before the open access week, and also the impact of open access publishing. They had a good turnout for it, and, and um, it was a good opportunity. The scholarly communication coordinator 
was able to follow up afterwards with individual departments and with campus faculty and individual campus faculty and administrators and was really able to highlight the institutional repository and the, you know, the tying in, you know, the open access policy with the, the way that it worked to get papers in, you know, postprints into the institutional repository and also to in, to getting a paper series deposited for a particular department. So, you know, just sort of ways to tie in all the different open access resources that are out there during that week. And that covers it for UCSF. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Annalisa. It was a fantastic presentation, a great way, uh, great way to start. Um, Unfortunately, I've been in conversation with uh, Daniel uh, Mutonga, our second presenter, who's, uh, I think, going to be hopefully coming to us from uh, a hospital in Nairobi where he works, uh, but unfortunately is having a few troubles at the moment. So I'm hoping we'll be able to get him on. Uh, but while I work with him to uh, hopefully get him logged on and uh, everything's stable there, uh, we're actually going to go ahead and have uh, Marianne uh, take over, and then hopefully we'll circle back to, to Daniel for able to get him on, but uh, Marianne, I'll go ahead and hand things over to you. Thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're coming through great. Excellent. Um, well, uh, my name is Marianne Reed. I work in the Office of Scholarly Communication and Copyright here in the University of Kansas Libraries, and I wanted to kind of share with you our experiences with growing Open Access Week and, and our evolution as a planning unit to get um, Open Access Week done. Um, the first thing we did was, let me see here, second, okay. So we decided, um, we have learned over the years, we started doing Open Access Weeks in 2010, and we've learned over the years that it really takes a village, that library staff and faculty and uh, Spark people and everyone to make a really great Open Access Week. So I wanted to share with you some of our experiences. Um, back in 2010, excuse me, let me go here. Um, we had five events, and the planning group consisted mainly of Ada Emmett, who's the head of our program here, and myself. Um, and we worked ourselves pretty much to the bone <laughs> trying to get these, these uh, events up. And they were really great, and they were well attended, uh, especially the, the one that seemed to resonate the most with um, students was our graduate student pizza lunch where we had two faculty members who were KU faculty members um, talk to graduate students about themselves as future scholars and uh, raising these issues in ways that I think these students had probably not had raised to them before. And so that was our, that was our first year, and it was quite successful, 150 attendees, um, mostly for the pizza lunch, but we had other people come to the other events too, and it worked out pretty well. Um, the next year, Again, it was still Ada and I doing the, uh, the planning. And we had the same presenters as we did last year. We had some, some collaborations with uh, local faculty and our, our general counsel's office, too. We did a copyright um, presentation that worked really well. And Ada and I also did some presenta presentations. And the, the one thing that we did this year that was a little, in 2011 that was a little different was we went ahead and we had one great big event. And that event um, included our, one of our local people. He doesn't live here anymore, but he's uh, from the University of Kansas. He was our provost for a while. And that's David Schulenberger. And then we had remotely joining us uh, Heather Joseph from Spark and Cliff Lynch from the Coalition for Networked Information. And it was a really great and well-attended um, presentation where it was a nice little panel discussion. Not everybody was in the room, but we had people joining us remotely, and um, it was very well-attended and very much appreciated uh, according to the feedback forms that we got. All right, so our next, our next year was 2012. And, you know, the thing is when you're doing it as a, as a committee of two, um, you realize that you really need some more help to, do, to make these things happen. Um, fortunately, in 2011, we did have some help with, from our dean's office 
to help do some of the logistics, especially for this great big event. But um, still, pretty much it was a two-person operation with some help from outside. And so in 2012, um, we had an opportunity to rethink the way that we wanted to do OE week planning. And um, that, was, that opportunity was uh, Ada Emmett took a visiting professorship at Purdue. And so it was leaving a, uh, a planning team of me, <laughs> which, which was uh, quite, quite scary. And so we worked with our dean and um, decided that we were going to go ahead and do an open access week planning committee. And we solicited volunteers from the library staff, um, six to eight, just about, I think is, was what we ended up with. And it was wonderful because it gave us a broad spectrum of ideas. Um, not that we didn't have a broad spectrum before, but it gave us some really new perspectives that were very, very effective. Um, we had people who had connections with not only with campus but beyond campus because of the nature of their work or just because of their social ties. There were a lot of connections there. And it gave us more hands to do the work. We were able to do events that were maybe a little bit more elaborate, that needed um, a little bit more hands-on touch because we had more hands to help with. The one thing that was the best uh, besides the committee, but the one thing that really helped us a lot, was that our library's uh, communications advancement and administration office helped with some of the logistics of uh, getting food ready, getting, um, uh, well, we didn't prepare the food, of course, but ordering food, uh, getting seating arrangements set up, things like that. It was really great. And then last but not least at all was the incredible support and ideas that we got from our Dean of Libraries, Lorraine Herricombe, um, who was just wonderful in helping us pull this all together and, and offering us support and assistance as needed. So comes 2013. Uh, we did six events with 270 attendees. We were so pleased with the way that the Open Access Week Planning Committee went that we went ahead and, and did that again. We got volunteers from the library staff. Um, we pulled together six events, um, including a great one from D uh, Dr. Schulenberger, who came and talked to us about federal fund funding agencies and open access. Um, Nick came back to speak at our graduate student pizza lunch. Uh, we had a presentation remotely uh, through Skype from Heather Piwawar. And we had a hands-on workshop. This was the first time that we'd ever had a really hands-on workshop. And this was for humanities faculty who were trying to increase their research visibility. Um, and then last but not least, we had an Impacts of Openness panel where we had people talking about the way that open information affects their work as scholars and as, uh, as people who work in the university. Just one second. Now, it, what's coming up this year is Ada Emmett, who is at the head of our program again, is going to be working with KU student groups to plan student-led events for our Open Access Week 2014. We're hoping to have some faculty panels and more hands-on workshops because that was so well received and it was such a nice change of pace than uh, the usual presentation style. So we're hoping to continue that, uh, that evolution of Open Access Week into some really valuable hands-on experiences for people. Uh, next thing I wanted to share was what lessons we've learned from all these four years of, three, four years of, um, of doing Open Access Week. And the first thing I wanted to share with you all was I really think this committee is the way to go. It, it, it just makes it a lot easier process in terms of getting enough people to do the work. It helps build information and enthusiasm among the library staff that are participating. Um, we have a lot of good results from, uh, from, from our Open Access Week committees. And the nice thing is it gives you an opportunity to guide 
some um, some ideas, and you get new ideas from people, and then you can you can sort of guide them, but you don't direct them. What, what I found the most useful was people would come up with fantastic ideas that really weren't necessarily quite connected with our Open Access Week. They were wonderful for for um, great ideas, but they weren't necessarily on target with what we needed for Open Access Week. And so one of the things I found the most helpful was to ask them, well, can you tell me more about how this idea relates to this year's Open Access Week theme? And it got us some really, really great events. Oh, excuse me. The other thing we learned is feed them. Feed them and they will come. Um, giving people food, even a little bit of food, seems to be a big attractant to get people into your Open Access Week events. Uh, the pizza lunch has always been a very, very, very popular thing. Um, for 50 graduate students the first couple years, it's been more the, the next couple years, but it's been really, really a nice way to make sure that people are interested and engaged and that they show up. Uh, the other thing for our other events, we just did simple refreshments like cookies or cheese and crackers, um, some sort of drink like water or coffee, depending on whether it was hot or cold outside. Um, just nice, simple, not very expensive refreshments, and it seems to make a big difference in terms of the way people come. The other thing that we learned is to plan at least one student event, and this year we're going to have more opportunities for that than ever before. But it was a great opportunity, these graduate student pizza lunches that we've done were really good opportunities for us to collaborate with the graduate school and or other student groups. Um, we used the graduate school's communication mechanisms to get the word out. They were very supportive, and it was a very, very positive experience for everything. Uh, there's a lot of topics you can talk about, and I think Annalise's point about hot topics on your campus is a really good point. Um, find things that are interesting and that people are talking about on your campus, and they'll come. They'll come to your events. Goodies. Goodies are always a great thing. If you have T-shirts um, or buttons, actually the open access buttons are very, very popular. And we have the black ones and the white ones and the orange ones. And so it's a very colorful, eye-catching display. Um, we also have I Love KU Libraries buttons. And again, those go every year. We have bunches of people that, that love to have our buttons. And they'll even ask about it if we don't put them out. The one thing that we did that I think worked really, really well was we had open access t-shirts for those library staff that volunteered uh, during open access week. And the reason why that was helpful was we're a multi-story library, multi many more, more floors than just one. And so what would happen is people would come in and they wouldn't know where to go for these events because sometimes these conference rooms are kind of tucked off in the corners of the library. And so having a person standing there with a t-shirt that was easily, visibly identifiable as someone who was with the event, who would be the friendly, helpful face that would help people figure out where the rooms were so that they could attend. It really, really made a difference, and it gave people something that would be a memento of their participation in Open Access Week. Uh, it's been really, really um, positive for us, and I think that's something we're going to hope to do again this year. The other thing we learned is that the speakers do not have to be on site, that uh, remote access works great, that as long as good, uh, you have good microphone and speaker connections so that people can hear each other and that they can talk to each other, uh, you can have a lot of interaction without somebody actually being in the room with, uh, at, during the event. The other thing we've learned is to take advantage of the really great resources that Spark makes available. Uh, we've used their flyers, we've had downloads of buttons, bookmarks, um, we've used their designs for t-shirts and adapted them a little for things that we wanted to use to, our, to have local t-shirts printed up. Um, it's been really, really helpful. And with students, the one thing that I found very useful is the uh, videos that are on the Right to Research um, website because students talking to other students get students' attention and it works very, very well. Uh, the other thing that we found that was very helpful is webinars. 
Spark does great webinars. And the Open Access We Kickoff webinar, to me, has been a very useful tool for getting people to uh, from our planning committees. That's our first meeting of the planning committee is to watch last year's open access kickoff webinar because it introduces people to the concepts of open access, the big issues of the day, and it also helps just sort of give you the sense as a committee that this is a global problem and this is a global solution that we're working on. This is not just us at KU. It's beyond us. And I think that's really wonderful. The other thing that's been great is uh, we've, some people from Spark have been able to actually speak at our events. Uh, Heather Joseph appeared uh, remotely um, at one of those events uh, in 2011. And Nick has helped us with our graduate student event in the last couple of years. Whoop. There we go. It's really important when you're doing Open Access Week planning to figure out how you're going to tell people about your Open Access Week events. Um, it's wonderful if you have existing communication channels that you can take advantage of. Um, word of mouth, just t asking your library staff if they can help you get the word out has been very, very, very useful for us. Um, as my, my, my favorite quote is that a personal invitation is worth a thousand flyers. We do use flyers and we do put them up and they're very eye-catching with their orange, but it's, we find that the personal touch really helps bring people in and that our, our librarians and staff have a lot of connections with campus and they can use those connections to tell people that these things are going on. Um, we also do some advertising through our library advisory groups. Um, again, very helpful in making sure that people who are already interested in open access know what's going on and that they can, they're welcome to participate. And of course, the university news channels uh, are, are, again, invaluable in getting news out, not only to the university but beyond, because sometimes we've had newspapers contact us for uh, interviews, et cetera. And that's really great because that spreads the, the information about open access so much, so much further. The one thing you need to be careful to do is to not forget library staff, that library staff participation is really crucial to Open Access Week, and it's also crucial to your future Open Access Weeks, because remember, you're, you're pulling from a pool of volunteers that are library staff people and to do your planning committee each year. Not everybody knows a lot about open access. Everybody seems to be kind of willing to learn. Um, so we just make sure that we send people, send information to the library staff. In other words, a save the date information email. Just say, hey, this is going to be coming on this week. Uh, these are the things that, that we're hoping to do. Um, watch this space for more information. Um, the other thing is, as soon as we have a solid schedule of events, I send that out to the library staff. And, and not only to the library staff, but again, if they know people on campus, they can help share that information through, that, through campus. We send requests for volunteers, um, not only the planning committee, but we have volunteers that actually help us during the events. In other words, the people who are either in the entryway waiting to help guide people, uh, people who have helped us with manning tables, serving food, all sorts of things that, that people can do to make an event run smoothly. And those volunteers are very, very valuable to us. And the one thing I found that worked the last time that we did this is to just send a message to everybody every day to say, hey, this is tomorrow's Open Access Week event, and that these are the things that um, this is the reason why you might be interested. And I think if you do it in a friendly, casual manner, it really helps build um, some excitement and some interest in the library community, inside the library. And the most important of all is to do a lessons learned um, session after you're done. What happens is you get you do this great open access week and you have feedback and the real question is, well, what do you do with it? And so getting everybody together to kind of talk through, well, this went well, this we could have done differently, we, we should have done it better, um, it's very, very useful for future open access week events. Uh, for planning committees, especially the we will never do that again, ever, 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 <laughs> those kinds of things. We haven't run into any of those yet, but I know that they exist. So it's one of the things where we found the, the taking the time to literally make 
one meeting of your group, like the last meeting of your group, into a lessons learned has been very, very helpful. And the other thing that I've found useful is after Open Access Week is over is to thank people. Um, it's really easy to go on to our work, which has usually been um, waiting a little bit because we've been working so hard on Open Access Week. And it's very, very important to thank the library, uh, the library staff that have helped you, to thank the administrators who have made this possible. We've had wonderful support from our dean and her administrative team uh, for this. Uh, Ada Emmett, who's the chair of our, who's the head of our Office of Scholarly Communications. Again, wonderful support for all of these, uh, these events and things. And so it's really important for people to feel appreciated. Otherwise, they will not come back or help Help you next year. So thinking about it as a long term. The other thing too is if you have local faculty coming to join you um, to do presentations or um, even who just come to, to events, um, thanking them for coming, thanking them for giving presentations. Again, very, very important because it builds those ties for next year's Open Access Week events and it's good manners. And I guess um, I'm done with my presentation. If there's any questions, I'm not sure how Nick wants to handle that. Great, thanks, Marianne. That was an absolutely fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, I think that was really, really, really useful. Uh, uh, so what we're going to do? I believe we have Daniel on the line. So with um, we can get him on. Hopefully, we can move to his presentation. Then, if we have any time left over at the end, um, then we can do do questions, uh, but Daniel, are you on the line? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Daniel, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, um, so my name is Daniel Mutonga. I'm a medical officer from the um, Chogoria Hospital in Kenya. Everyone following along? So I'm also the liaison officer to Africa um, under the Right to Research Coalition. I'm a medical student representative and a board member of the International Physician for the Medical for Prevention of Nuclear War in Kenya, and also was the president of the Medical Students Association of Kenya. Um, so for those of you who might not know where Kenya is, uh, that's the, the red country in the east of Africa, and we recently turned 50. Um, that was a logo that we used, Kenya 50, um, during our celebrations uh, for independence after having uh, 50 years. And we have a vision to become a middle income country, which is termed as the Vision 2030. It has three prongs, um, economic, social, and political. And the social pillar education falls in, and in that line I believe open access, which talks about right to research, and right to health. So I'll focus more on the slides about the work that you've done in Kenya. Um, so a brief overview is that I'll define open access, what players are in open access, and why students are needed in the open access advocacy, and a brief scope of uh, what I think are the main activities within open access. Then my main presentation will border on what MSAKE, the Medical Students Association of Kenya did uh, from between 2011 to 2014 currently. So um, I won't go details into open access because this is something that is clear, uh, but just to mention that money is not the main goal when it comes to research but rather impact. So I'll just quickly brush off and go on to the slides about what we did in Kenya. Uh, but uh, why I brought this slide is just to mention that apart from the money question, because open access is all about making information digital, online, free of charge, uh, we also have to consider other barriers, such as connectivity, perhaps, and language. So when we advocate about open access, we're not just talking about um, access to information, but that those who are unable to access um, internet, for instance. So the open access arena varies from journals and, repo and repositories to education resources, 
and data. And the advocates can be researchers, the civil society, and policy makers. Now, I'm particularly interested on students. So why do students need open access advocacy? I believe uh, one quote uh, which I got from Mary, um, uh, one of our students who is active in open access advocacy in Kenya, she says that if your professors can't read it, they can't teach it. So it's not only for the students to get the information, but open access makes it possible for the teachers to equip the students. And uh, on the last bullet, perhaps having, having information outside the teaching institution is of importance for students. So open access advocacy, as we've done in, uh, under the Medical Student Association of Kenya, could include publication. Um, so we have, um, we have part of our, our student body uh, writing on the overview of what Kenya has been has been doing in terms of open access advocacy. And I think you'll get some of this from the reference section. So you can write papers, you can write your ideas. You can also talk um, through the radios. Uh, we have not, uh, uh, we have not used this model, but this is an op a model that is open to all. We can also train and use workshops, and that's something that we have been really particular on. So perhaps the tools that we use during the war workshops could include um, posters, T-shirts, banners, handouts, um, and also sharing publications that we have read or have written in terms of um, the, 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 the current state of open access. So how we got involved mainly draws from our participation in international conferences. So borrowing from the Berlin 10 where SPAC made a statement that students should be the center of the open access advocacy. So on the right, uh, that's just a photo of one of uh, us having dinner uh, at the end of the Berlin 10 conference. Later on, this year, uh, last year, sorry, uh, I think most of you may be familiar with some of the people in this photo. We have Joe, who has been instrumental uh, towards the open access button, and Andreka, who has been uh, an, an inspiration to many of us uh, because of his use of Google and coming up with um, ad shattering um, research. Uh, and, and, and this just goes to show how open access can make such a difference in our generation. So this is my main talk. Um, I'll quickly go through the slides of how open access advocacy has been done in Kenya. So we learned about open access advocacy um, from a meeting of medical students um, in, in Copenhagen in Denmark where uh, Nick Shockey was speaking to, to medical students all over the world about open access and its benefits. And the International Federation of Medical Students Association put in um, an open access policy. And from there, Kenya, being a member of the IFMSA, began activities by liaising to open access advocates internationally and those um, within the country. So we got in touch with our librarians from the University of Nairobi, and they have been very instrumental. Um, in fact, um, one of the, uh, on, the, on, the on, on the last section about open access uh, inter uh, institutional repository pol policy that was discussed in the University of Nairobi on 30th August 2012, which resulted in uh, the University of Nairobi uh, adopting an open access policy. Most of the work in terms of proposal and, and advocacy was done by the librarians. And so we have a strong support from the CLISP, which is the Kenya Libraries and Information Services Consortium led by Rosemary Otando. So we did several activities from 2011 up to date. So on the left top panel, you can see that was the meeting where we first learned about open access. So I believe meetings where students come physically together is a good way to talk about open access. So if you're able to get your students, whether they be in their hundreds or just um, tens, and that will be a good way to begin discussing about the benefits of open access. Uh, another way of talking about it to your institution, on the top right 
uh, this was a board meeting where the leaders of the University of Nairobi were discussing about uh, adopting an open access policy. And students, uh, while I was a student at the University of Nairobi, I presented at this workshop, and this uh, went a long way. So we can also engage our lecturers and our, uh, and, uh, and our administrators through workshops, through letters, through office meetings and courtesy calls, whichever way that works within your institution. And on the bottom panel, we can see uh, medical students. So being, uh, being familiar with, uh, with, with screening for uh, diabetes and hypertension, we chose that to be a way to attract students to the booths and thereafter give them flyers and information about open access and why uh, health information or information in general is the right for all. We have also had, um, on, that's what you can see on the bottom right panel, uh, we introduced uh, open access to another organization, IPPNW, that's the International Prevention, uh, Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War. So one way that we have been uh, advocating for open access in our institution has been to attend international meetings where students are attending and sell that idea to the rest of the team. Um, in particular, in 2012, we had support from the Right to Research Coalition and uh, INAS where we applied for grants and we were able to conduct an open access training. So we brought in students from the University of Nairobi, from Moi University, from Egerton and Kenyatta. So these are the main medical uh, training institutions in Kenya. And so we had them in a room. That's what you can see on the top, top left. And um, we, had, we had lunch, as the uh, earlier presenter had said. So lunch is a good uh, motivation. Uh, we had also transport allowances for those who had to take buses um, to get to Nairobi. And at the end of it, we gave out CDs and certificates. Certificates, we found this to be an incentive for students to attend our workshops. And then we rolled out what we had learned in that one-day training. And you can see on the rest of the panel, the students are talking to their colleagues in their different institutions about open access. Um, so open access has not been limited to the Medical Student Association of Kenya. We have other groups. So this panel just shows other institutions within, the, within Kenya that are also uh, participating in open access. And just to borrow from what I learned from the Berlin Early Research and Early Researchers and Students Conference, this was a poster that was made by, uh, by the Norwegian uh, uh, group. And you can see um, it was strange for me because um, these, were, I was told, were fashionistas. And at the back right, these are famous professors. So what I learned from this poster uh, from Matt Moland, uh, who, was, uh, who was giving a talk about what they have done in Norway, is that the open access advocacy needs to be culturally appropriate. So you can use the context of your setting. So this might not work well within my country, but if it works within your setting, then go ahead and do that. Um, so it needs to be fun. This is also a slide I got from the Open Access Nigeria team. So I believe uh, they have made very good t-shirts. And this is one of the ways which you can, uh, you can use to sell your ideas and attract students towards open access. So collaboration, that's a key lesson. We couldn't do it on our own. As a medical students group, we have limited funding, and so we had to, be out, uh, we had to seek resources from our partners. And these are some of the partners, the University of Nairobi, the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, the Rights to Research Coalition, which uh, without whom we would not have been able to conduct any activities in 2012, and INAS, which usually conducts an annual a grant competition. So um, it is important for students to work with others. And our efforts, just to emphasize on the role of the institution, uh, the library played a 
key roles. So it conducted most of the workshops and invited us to attend. And in some of these workshops, we learned that, uh, that open access um, faces certain challenges in terms of, uh, in terms of underutilization. So one of the challenges uh, uh, which I'll be discussing in the earlier slides is that even after talking to students about the use of open, ac uh, open, open access, then you need to follow up, get feedback. Are they using this information? What are they doing with this information? Are they accessing journals? Perhaps this can be done through research and feedback after your events have been conducted. So one of our librarians says that the libra library's efforts have continued to bear fruit, and that's Agatha Kabugu, who has written an article um, which you can get at the end of the slide in part of the reference section. So just to say that from the work of the University of Nairobi, we have been able to have an institution, uh, one of the leading institutions in Kenya, uh, uh, put up a, a repository, and this, is, this goes a long way in terms of enhancing the, 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 the enhancing the work of open access. But just to highlight the challenges in the north and south to access of information is different. And I believe these challenges will perhaps be reflected even as you plan um, open access uh, activities. So for those in the south, we face a lower budgets. We also uh, have communication infrastructure. So perhaps webcasts and webinars may not be a good uh, platform for those in the south, but if this isn't a problem, then you can go ahead with that. Um, the region culture uh, might be poorer in, uh, in low resource settings, perhaps due to literacy or perhaps the, 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 uh, this, this was a reference I got from um, an article, Can We Achieve Health Information for All by 2015? And they cite as perhaps having lower prospects in terms of career development in the south been one of the challenges towards access to information. But generally, cost is, 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 uh, cost is a challenge that all of us will face, and perhaps lack of mentorship towards how to conduct these activities. So one of the solutions we did as Msake was to identify our librarians as possible mentors. And for cost, we were able to talk to funders who are able to support our work in, in terms of open access. And we're still addressing the other challenges. And we keep on reflecting and finding data and finding information as to how we can address the other challenges. Just to emphasize, once you've conducted your activities, send it out to the masses. So you can use social media, you can use YouTube, you can put up clips, you can uh, write blogs, you can send your information to other interested parties, and you can conduct interviews. So one of the, one of the, uh, one of the logos for Radio Netherlands Worldwide uh, interviewed some of the participants of Msake, and we were able to discuss um, what we had, we had done in terms of the open access ad advocacy. Uh, advocacy. So I believe that once you've done your activities, send it out there. There's a good blog, um, the Open Access Week, uh, which is a good platform where you can post what you want to do, post photos, and let the world know of what you're doing. In the next one or two minutes, um, this is not very uh, clear, but we were trying to just analyze um, what, what our output in terms of uh, social media activity went. And so we could see that some, I'll not dwell on this slide because it's not very clear, but there were some posts we put up on our Facebook page uh, for the Open Access Initiative, um, Sake, that received about 255 views. Some received only 181, some received only 14. So it depends on how you present your data. So one of the lessons we learned is that um, it's good to have a longer message and perhaps ask your participants to, to, to do an activity. Perhaps you can tell them, uh, please uh, log in to this or like this, an instruction that will uh, attract them towards your social media platform. So just lastly, um, uh, towards the end, uh, this is an activity we conducted um, two weeks ago 
So this was a workshop at the University of Nairobi, and some of these, uh, most of these are student leaders from different organizations, and at the back we have seen doctors being part of our open access advocacy. So we again need to collaborate with all fields and not just one particular organization. So if you're able to work with different organizations, student bodies, you're able to do a bigger and better job. So in this particular workshop, uh, the one of the uh, the lady in the middle is the president, the current president of um, Sake. She's called Maggie, and the volunteers who are giving out the handbooks and the and the, and the badges and the notebooks, they come from a different organization, the IPPNW. So just to emphasize that you don't have to do it alone. Work with others, and you're able to do bigger and better. Uh, like the common adage, um, um, if you go, if you want to go far, fast go alone, but if you want to go far, go with others. And in summary, the lessons that you learned will be in this slide that you need to be culturally appropriate. For, for us, what works are formal lectures where we, 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 we book a room where we're able to, um, to have a program and we have guests uh, and we set it out clearly, perhaps a one-day conference and you have lunch and tea break in between. So that ha works well for us. And at the end of it all, we give out certificates and this is attractive for our audience. Participate. So uh, do something. Um, I'll, I, I just like we heard about the open access in 2011 and got involved. So it's possible for you to hear of this uh, during this webcast but get involved, sign into the Right Research Coalition, participate in an open access week activity, um, and you can do this with friends, you can do this with family, and you can do this with the institution. Perhaps chart us a plan, we did proposals and we wrote budgets, and this worked well for our funders, and we were able to account for how we, we use our finances and perhaps plan better. And then again, be positive, pray and hope, because everything may not go as, as planned, but be, be positive and have fun. And then again, just to emphasize, once you've done your activity, record it, whether by photo, via photos or videos and post them and circulate them. So just to cite some of the, the references where we can get more information about open access, so I particularly liked one from Peter Suba, an open access overview. And then the paper I highlighted earlier, Can We Achieve Information for All by Fiona Godley, can, can, tell you, uh, can, be, can inform you about the challenges, especially within the low resource settings. So you, it, it needs to be appropriate in your, in your culture. And then some of the references can be used to some of the references can be used to see what other work we have done. So I think I'm done at the moment, unless there are other questions. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Great. Thanks. 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 Fantastic. Sorry. Fantastic. Oh, if you could mute that. <laughs> end. Perfect. Uh, well, I think we've uh, gone 10 minutes uh, over, so I'm afraid we don't have time for questions. So uh, if you do have specific questions and uh, that you'd like uh, address, you can uh, feel free to email me directly at nick at arl.org, and I can do my best to either answer them to, uh, myself or, or connect with the speakers to get them answered if you do have any, any burning questions. Uh, but I just want to uh, thank our speakers one more time. It was, I think, absolutely fantastic presentations uh, from, from everybody, and it was great that we could get uh, Daniel in here very clearly. Uh, and Daniel, really appreciate your taking the time to participate. I know it's uh, getting quite, quite late there uh, in Kenya. So uh, a big thanks to our speakers for such fantastic presentations. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, and you'll be receiving an email within the next two to three days with a link uh, of where this webcast will be, uh, will be available online uh, for others if you want to forward it along. And then finally, uh, please do be in touch as you're planning your Open Access Week events. Um, please record them on the openaccessweek.org website. Uh, be in touch and let us know. Uh, you know, what you're planning to do for the week uh, and also follow up after the events are done, uh, you know, so we know that you celebrated uh, the week and can sort of put you out on the map. Uh, and again, if you have any ideas for how we can support you in planning your events either through webcasts or other types of resources, uh, please, again, don't hesitate to let us know either through Twitter uh, or by emailing me directly at nick 
at ARL.org. Uh, and then finally, I hope this was uh, a useful webcast to kick off uh, your planning events. We really honestly cannot wait to see uh, what everybody uh, sort of puts together to celebrate the week. And uh, we, we look forward to, to seeing all that. Thanks again for tuning in, uh, and have a good day.